How's it going, everybody? It's Pilot Flame, and we are back with another FPL live stream here on Twitch. And today, it's Game Week 5 time. We're going to take a look at Game Week 4. Just finished uh, today with Spurs versus Forest being the last game of the Game Week. Quick turnaround. We got a preview stream tonight. Got a preview stream tomorrow night. Or a deadline stream, sorry. Which is uh, going to be before the actual FPL deadline. Uh, because I'm going to be pretty busy on Tuesday. So... Um, can't do the deadline then. Also, it's middle of the week anyway. I have the day off, but I'm going to be doing other things that I've already planned ahead of time. So I'll be doing the stream before. I'll make sure I still have, like, the chat open. So if I can't answer any questions, uh, for the preview over on YouTube, to be able to answer any questions for that. It would probably be best to send me, uh, any, ch uh, questions that you may have, uh, on the, com the comments of the video. I see those quicker, um, uh, to be honest. Um, uh, but yeah, you also get your an uh, question answered almost, uh, immediately for for the most part because it comes directly to my phone but yeah we're going to take a look at how we did in game week four we're going to see how we're looking into game week five we're going to see kind of did the transfers pay off that i made did they not and also the title of the stream with holland kind of looking over his shoulder a bit concerned is rotation now looming there is a lot of fixtures that need to be played between now and the world cup and there's going to be a lot of teams playing midweek and weekend from here on out. So, without further ado, let's see how we did in game week four. So I can't see an absolute thing out of my glasses. Uh, but what I can say though is that uh, uh, we got a red arrow, unfortunately. Um, just a small one, so I'm not too upset about it. Um, I also probably look different without my glasses on. Um, I used to wear contacts for a long period of time, but now I can't wear them for more than a shorter period of time. Not sure why, uh, to be honest. Um, I don't think I'll ever get laser eye surgery done. Uh, I don't know. Um, these glasses are comfortable, though. Um, they look nice, but I do have to clean them from time to time. But, moving on to more relatable topics for the stream. FPL did get a red arrow, albeit it was a small one. I think we only went down, like... Uh, 170k, which, you know, at my current rank isn't the, the craziest amount. Uh, I think we needed a score of 68 to get, like, a gray slash small green. Uh, if I hadn't made my transfers, I would have gotten that. Uh, because we have uh, Gundogan, uh, who got us four points. Uh, I would have played Neto, uh, probably, who would have... Uh, he, I believe he uh, only got just the one point. I think he got booked. Um... In the game, if I remember correctly. Uh, let me actually just double check that. Did Neto get booked? Uh, he did, yeah. So, he would have got one point. Because his team conceded. Um, and Robertson would have got nine. Because Robertson got a clean sheet. He got an assist, but he didn't get any bonus points. Whereas Trippier and Gundogan got a total of six. So, I lost four points by making those two free transfers. However, however... I do like my prospects going forward. Does Trippier have the greatest fixture this week versus Liverpool? Probably not. But Gundogan looks like he could be starting come uh, Wednesday, I think, when Man City play. Because there is going to be rotation. Because now, basically the way it uh, is, because of the World Cup, because of the jam-packed schedule, a barring a between a, a, a game... A we a, a, Can't even say the word probably. Game week eight... Uh, between Game Week 8 and Game Week 9, when a lot of managers are going to be looking to wildcard, potentially, there's an international break. The only one before the um, before the World Cup. Which means that Man City, Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal, Manchester United, Tottenham, or Spurs, and West Ham all have to play midweek and weekend from now until the World Cup. And they only have the one week off when everyone has international break. And more than likely, those players are going to be playing uh, in for their international teams as well. With that being said, though, some of the players going to... The, uh, or some of the players in our FPL teams currently may not be in the World Cup. As an example, Mo Salah, Erling Haaland. They probably won't... Uh, they, well, they won't play in the World Cup. Uh, Gundogan should go to the World Cup. Uh, for Germany, probably, but might not. Uh, Jao Cancelo will. Reese James 
may or may not. Just depends on the England. Ramsdale will probably end up going. Trent should go, I guess, uh, as well. Uh, but again, they could not be picked. But their countries are. Whereas Holland and Salah, uh, Diaz as well for, for Liverpool, those players are definitely not going. So there is a chance that the rotation may not be as severe for those players because the manager does know that they won't be playing uh, for basically a month uh, when the World Cup um, ends. Because basically the first game back after the World Cup is the Boxing Day fixtures, if I remember correctly. Because they have like a week off before Boxing Day or week off-ish. Um, and then it's back into Premier League action. So... That could mean that there could be rotation for a lot more players than others. Some players are a bit more crucial to the team than not. Um, so, like, as an example, if Salah, let's say Egypt was going to the World Cup, hypothetically, right? Salah is basically the only player who can play on the right-hand side as well as he does than anyone else in the Liverpool team when they're fully fit. Jota's best position is either false nine or out on the left. Diaz's best position, out on the left. Firmino's position, false nine through the center. Um, Darwin Nunez's position, through the middle or out on the left. Salah's best position, out on the right. So I think someone like him would be playing more games than not, even if there was a congested set of fixtures. And some players just recover faster than others, as an example. Pep Guardiola mentioned Riyad Mahrez, Raheem Sterling. These sorts of players tend to play a lot of games because they can recover quite quickly. Erling Haaland, not so much. So, and Pep's already come on and said it, that when they'll be playing three games a week, Haaland's not going to play all of them. Now, does that start this week? We don't know. That's the kind of decision we need to, to, to see firsthand. Is it a situation where... You know, Man City's fixture. Forest at home, Aston Villa away. Is Pep going to want to play Erling Haaland versus Spurs? Yeah, probably. Is Pep going to want to play uh, Haaland versus Sevilla? I'm not sure if that's away or home. Let me double check that. Um... I'm going to double check that. Man City. Man City's first game in the Champions League is away to Sevilla on the Tuesday. So, Holland will want will probably play versus Sevilla, I would think. And he's going to play versus Spurs, but will he also play versus Dortmund? What about Wolves? They then play the Manchester Derby. He's going to want to play in that. Which games is Holland going to play? If it was me, I would say that Holland should play versus Sevilla. He should play versus Spurs. And he should play versus Dortmund. Maybe not necessarily play versus Wolves. He's definitely going to want to play versus United. But maybe not the two Copenhagen games. Klopp's def I mean, not Klopp. Uh, Pep's definitely going to want him for the Liverpool game. So which one of these next two does he miss out? Does he play Haaland versus Forrest and then give him basically almost a week's rest so that he can play versus Sevilla, Spurs, and Dortmund and then a rest versus Wolves and then play in the Manchester Derby? We'll have to wait and see because otherwise I'm looking at three games in Sevilla away, Spurs at home, uh, Dortmund at home, where Haaland should be playing those three. Those are three very... Like, Sevilla and Dortmund are the two hardest teams in their group, and they're going to want to beat them uh, and get a nice early advantage. Spurs is probably going to be one of the trickiest teams they play all season. So, with that being said, is rotation legitimately looming, or is it just potentially a somewhat of a farce? With Arsenal and Man United, I think it's a different story. And I think the reason for that is is because of the fact that they play Europa League. Europa League is not like Champions League. The teams in their group are not going to be nearly as difficult. We'll take Man United as an example. Man United in their Europa League group. They play Real Sociedad. 
They play Sheriff, who was in the Champions League last season, who notoriously beat Real Madrid. And they play a team, Omonia? Omonia? Never heard of them before. But three teams that you would expect United to potentially play, like Sociedad might be a bit tricky, but in general, should be able to play a rotated side and beat them comfortably. Right? Arsenal. Arsenal have a very good squad. Arsenal's squad currently has some players which can basically seamlessly fit in. Eddie and Ketia can play up front for Gabriel Jesus. You have Smith Rowe who can come in for Martinelli. You have Vieira who can come in for Martin Odegaard. Um, you have that uh, kid Marquinhos who can come in for uh, Bakayo Saka. You have Sambi Lakonga who can come in uh, in midfield. You have, um, you know, Cedric, you have Tierney, you have uh, Tommy Asu who can come in for Ben White. Ben White can play at center back. And their teams are FC Zurich, potentially tricky, not sure how good they are. Uh, PSV, that's probably good. potentially probably the toughest game in their group. And then Bodo slash Glimt, I don't know who that is. Sorry if I, you know, my, my football knowledge doesn't go that deep. West Ham is another one that also has European football, but that'll be playing Thursday, Sunday for the foreseeable future. They play FCSB, whoever that is, uh, Silkenborg, uh, and Anderlecht. Anderlecht will probably be somewhat of a test, but the other two, I'm not sure what leagues they play in um, at all, basically. So, pretty much... For the Europa League teams, they're going to rotate their squads heavily. And they're going to see if they can get by with that. With Arsenal, I think they have the best chance to do that because of the players that they can bring in. Right? They can play Matt Turner, who's a halfway decent goalkeeper from what I've seen. The little bits of, um, you know, preseason. They can uh, swap out their fullbacks. They can put Ben White at center back alongside somebody else uh, in there. They could have uh, Laconga in midfield. They can bring in Vieira. They can bring in um, Smith Rowe. They can bring in Eddie and Ketia. They can bring in Marquinhos. They have a decent number of players that they can just swap in. Man United? Not so much, to be honest. I mean, center backs, they can swap in Maguire and Lindelof. I don't think that's very good. It's not like Arsenal where they can just bring in... They could just put Ben White at center back because they can just play Tommy Asu at right back. Right? Ben White's a very good, solid defender. Maguire and Lindelof as a pair, in my opinion, have not really worked ever in a system that's going to be one to be played by Ten Hag. At right back, we have Aaron Wambasaka who just doesn't seem to play. And Luke Shaw, who hasn't played well... In the first two games of the season. And was rightfully dropped. Our backup goalkeeper is Tom Heaton. He had a really bad injury. And then he's come back. And he's looked. And I think he's had like one game that he's played for Man United. In midfield. Now that Casemiro's in there. You're probably going to see McTominay and Fred. Probably. Those will be the two backups. Uh, you're probably going to see Anthony Alanga. You're probably going to see... Uh, maybe Alejandro Garnacho. You might see Donny van der Beek. And then who knows who's going to play up front. That team can be beaten potentially by Russo. So that even though it probably shouldn't be. But it can be. And who knows how well that team's going to be able to play under Eric Ten Hag's system. Same with West Ham. Their team in the front areas has depth. You know, Antonio versus, for Skamaka. Uh, ben Rama for Four Nows. Um, you have Lanzini. Uh, you have, uh, you know, Jared Bowen. Uh, they brought a new central midfielder, if I remember correctly. Um, I think they strengthened the defensive areas as well. They have Emerson Palmieri from Chelsea now. Uh, they have Ariola who can play in goal. They still have a decent number of players that they can swap in directly and almost make another full 11, potentially. That's going to do all right. But the Champions League teams is where things are going to get rotated a lot, I think. Chelsea, I think their only real tough game in their group is AC Milan. So maybe Chelsea, not as much. Man City, Pep likes to rotate. Klopp can't really rotate at the moment. So he might be in a bit of a sticky situation. And all of his games are kind of like not really gimmies. 
but they're not really easy either. They're the ones that Liverpool play like the way they did versus Man United. They'll lose to every single one of those teams, right? Spurs, they have a good squad to rotate. There is a situation where Holland does get rotated, but I don't think it's going to be as much as people make it seem. Like everyone seems to make it seem like the second the Champions League comes in, Holland's never playing a Premier League game again. That's not going to happen. It's not right. He's going to play in the Premier League. I mean, why would you bench a guy that scored six goals so far in four games? Like, come on. Like, Julian Alvarez is great. Don't get me wrong. But you got to play one of them. And Holland's going to probably play in the important games. And one of those important games is Sevilla. One of those important games is Dortmund. And one of those important games is Spurs. And they're all back to back to back to back. So, something's got to give. But I've ranted enough on, on the European games. Jones in the chat says, Liverpool nine goals and no Salah contributions. Funny you say that. There is a statistic out there that says that that likelihood of Salah not scoring in a 9-0 game at home for Liverpool is 1 in 2.3 million. How about that one for a statistic? But let's go to the team. So, we have Aaron Ramsdale with just the two points. Arsenal conceded a goal to Fulham, which was kind of a partial mistake by Gabriel. Uh, we have Trent Alexander-Arnold, who was part of that... Uh, that 9-0 drubbing. Clean sheet, goal assist, couple of bonus points. Fantastic. Um, he actually was able to get me a decent amount of rank prize. We actually got about half his points worth uh, at my rank, which is good. Karen Trippier, disappointed with the Ruben Neves goal. But he is a much longer term pick. Um, like BPS wise, I mean, he was still like... Uh, you know, 14 BPS. If he keeps a clean sheet, he's like in the 30 mark or whatever it is. Uh, and he's looking good. So I think uh, Kieran Trippier is potentially uh, a very good long-term hold. Uh, Liverpool away this week. That's going to be tricky. But these run of fixtures here is where we want to potentially keep him for. Because um, they look quite good. Maybe we keep him through the wild card if we do get a wild card then. Uh, between gimmick 8 and gimmick 9. Reese James, 7 points. I mean, he's not going anywhere, is he? He's Reese James. Perisic. Doing well for us. Like, Perisic didn't play... Like, he played, what, 35 minutes first two games? And he's gotten close to six points a game if you add all his points up. Because six plus 12 is 18, plus four is 22, plus one is 23. Yeah, just shy of six points a match, which is uh, great uh, for Perisic. John says, Sterling finally turning in for me. Yes, Sterling was very good. Very, very good. Two goals. I mean... It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, huh, Kukurel and Reese James are kind of good at crossing the ball. What's Sterling very good at? Oh, right. He can literally start behind any defender and sprint past them if the ball is laid across the six-yard box. Who would have thought it? It only took his, what, five years or whatever he was at Man City to figure that out. Like, it's, it ain't rocket science. They, they did it for Man City all the time. All two has to do is stop playing loft his cheek at right wing back and nonsense like that and just actually attack teams that's all he has to do he'll blitz most teams in the league <laughs> like it ain't hard what do you think Aspilicueta just can't defend I mean he might not be able to defend but just tell Reese James to be a bit more mindful and cover that's it my three Chelsea players are Sterling Reese James and Kukurea yeah you got all the returns when Tuchel actually finally turns on his brain, and, I mean, the reason probably Chelsea actually did well is because the guy probably on the touchline took over because he was up in the stands and said, huh, maybe we should play our wingbacks at wingback and actually let them cross the ball. And guess what? They scored. Also, funnily enough, they take off Mason Mount and they look miles better, by the way, with 10 men. <laughs> like, they have it to feel like, literally... The team is almost perfect. Like, Chelsea's team is almost perfect. When fully fit, it's almost perfect. Mendy is still questionable with the ball at his feet. That's yet... That's, you know... You have, you have to potentially fix that. But... Great. Very good at shot stopping. Good penalty saver. All that sort of stuff. Reese James. Brilliant right wing back. Thiago Silva. Koulibaly. 
and Fafana are going to be fantastic at, at center back. I don't doubt that in, for one second. Kukurea, Chilwell, doesn't matter. You could pick anyone there. Genuinely speaking, I'd probably put Ben Chilwell in the front three at this point. Um, in center of defense, or center of midfield, you would have Conte and Kovacic. Are going to be the best midfield two in the league when they're on form. Uh, and then up front, you have Sterling, who can play off the right, off the left, through the middle. Doesn't matter. You just need two other players that aren't terrible. Like, genuinely terrible. Like, Mason Mount and Kai Havertz might as well not play. They might as well not play. Yeah, cool. They maybe like, like Jones says here, Havertz is brilliant off the ball. He just needs to be more confident. Jesse Lingard was apparently good off the ball too for Man United. The problem is, is in football, when you play and you're an attacking player, sometimes you need the ball. <laughs> and if you need the ball, you need to do something with the ball. And if you're not good on the ball, you can't play football. <laughs> Genuinely. Unless your role is very specific where you don't need the ball for very long. Prime example, Joe Linton. Joe Linton was turned into a central midfielder that is just a pressing monster, uses a battering ram, keeps it simple, gets the ball and plays at five yards. He still makes mistakes, but his role was simplified to where it would fix his game. The problem is I think Havertz is trying to do too much because he's probably being asked to do too much by Tuchel. Same with Mason Mount. Does anyone know what Mason Mount's best position is? Because it's not in a 3-4-3. He can't play in the midfield too, I don't think, in a 3-4-3. I don't think he's good to play as one of the tens in behind the striker in the front three. I don't think he can play off the left. I don't think he can play off the right. I think his best position is a box-to-box -box number eight in a midfield three. That's where I think he's the best because he's good at pressing. He's good at covering uh, defensive positions, and he's good with doing the pass before the pass, basically. Those sorts of things he's good at. If you want... Mason Mount playing in off the left in a front three. He's no good. He's just going to cut on his right foot and shoot and do nothing. He's going to get lost in the game. That's, that, that's basically what I've seen from Mason Mount a lot. And unfortunately, it's what happens to a lot of English players is they become very good very quick and then they're basically like square peg into round hold into every position known to Mac. It's like, this player is good. Let's put him everywhere. And then they don't end up actually mastering anything. Really? So, that's kind of the problem with Mason Mount. I think Chelsea just as a whole are just dysfunctional. Like, in an ideal world, you have a striker who is good at hold, like holding up the ball and good in movement in and around the box. You play Sterling on the right and you get a proper left winger that can like create. Not just a Mason Mount who basically plays central midfield that's just being shoehorned out there. Not a Kai Havertz who plays like a number 10. Not a Timo Werner who needs to play in a front in a front two. Like if Christian Pulisic was fit week in, week out, Christian Pulisic would be perfect. Because Christian Pulisic is very creative on both feet. But the problem is, is that the majority of the time he's never even on the bench. So, this is injured. Mount is the number eight, and Havertz, I'm nearly sure, played as a second striker when he was at his best at Leverkusen, but we don't have a proper number nine. When I talk about it. Exactly, but the thing is, you also play a front three as well. That's the problem. The number 10 position has basically evolved, in a sense, to a false nine, kind of. Because you have a three central midfield. That's kind of where it's evolved to. And Havertz can't play as a, so, as a solo guy up top. He's not. It doesn't seem like he's strong enough like on the ball to do that. It seems like when he's tasked to do that, he gets dispossessed a lot. Like Timo Werner. Timo Werner was perfect for Leipzig, which he's now gone back to. Because he had a guy like Poulsen who would basically basically take in the ball, retain it. And Werner would run in behind him. The big man, small man type of dynamic. That's basically what why Timo Werner was so good. So, yeah, I'm not sure how they're going to fix that problem because Havertz was a very expensive player. Chelsea just, like like Lukaku, Chelsea bought Lukaku thinking, hey, look, he's going to be the guy who's going to bring guys into play, then he's going to get in the box and he's going to score goals. problem with Lukaku is that's not Lukaku's game. Lukaku doesn't do hold-up play. Yes, he learned it in Serie A, but the Premier League's too fast for him to be able to do that because he takes too long on the ball. 
But Chelsea also need to kind of just cross the ball to him, too. That's another thing. A lot of managers ask their strikers to kind of drop off the line a lot, which is just bad. Just do what Haaland does. Just be a beast. Just get in the box and you just have good deliveries like Phil Foden and De Bruyne and you just hit the ball in the goal. Football's not that hard. Havertz had good form in the second half of last season. But did he? Like, Havertz played in the front three for Chelsea last season, right? Last time I checked. Last season, he scored eight goals and got four assists. Is that good? No. That's not good at all. It's just not. For a team that can create the number of chances that they do with like Reese James and Chilwell, that Chelsea should be able to just dominate the ball and create chances for. Havertz was not good. He was just not. Every time Havertz was in the team, Chelsea were worse. Just genuinely speaking. I think Mount seems to be like that this season. And Tuchel plays both of them. So, I think personally, personally, what Chelsea should do is play Broya. But that's just me. He was a false nine last season. That was the second half after everything happened with Lukaku. But yeah, but the thing is, even being a false nine, like, Havertz got eight goals and four assists for Chelsea. Phil Foden played a false nine as well. Phil Foden got nine goals, six assists, played 2,100 minutes, right? How much did Havertz play? Let's see. This is just an experiment. Yes, Man City's a better team, but... Harris only played 1,800 minutes last season. Why is that? Because probably the majority of the time he was bad. Or injured. So you can say probably in 1,800 minutes, 8 goals and 4 assists is probably pretty good. But for me, that just seems like a def potential deficiency in his game. Like, every time I see Havertz play, I'm never like, Oh, he's gonna do, he's gonna, you know, win the game for them. I mean, yes, he scored one important goal in the Champions League. Cool. But in the Premier League, he's not been anything, basically. Like, I just don't know what he is. Like, I know he should be playing like a number 10. Problem is, Chelsea don't play with a number 10. Again, they bought this guy who was a very highly talented player for a lot of money. And he has no position to play in, basically. Pretty much. Lukaku is a different situation. I think they just bought him because they're like, oh, Lukaku scores goals. He's a striker. But is he the right type of striker to play for Chelsea? No, he's not. You know who Chelsea could do with? Ronaldo. <laughs> That's who Chelsea could play. Because Ronaldo would just... If you told Ronaldo, get in the box, we'll cross you the ball. Ronaldo would get in the box and he will head the ball in and, and, and take the ball and, you know, wait for it to be crossed in. Because Chelsea retained the ball so much... That you could just uh, sling the ball in with Reese James, and he would just head the ball in. Like, do we? Do you think that Ronaldo would be doing the exact same thing Holland's doing right now for Man City? For the most part, probably yeah. And the reason being is because Ronaldo just gets in the box. Uh, if you, if 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 he, if you, you know, assure him that there's going to be good delivery. If you assure him he's going to be a good delivery, we're not going to be in the box. Guaranteed. 100%. The score your goals. Plain and simple. That's basically what Ronaldo's game is devolved, as it were. You could say evolved, devolved, whatever. Into, basically. He's a goal poacher now. That has individual moments of brilliance every now and again. Right? But that's what I think with Chelsea. Chelsea should play somebody who's good at holding up the ball... Who can still is mobile enough to run in behind, and is and is a good presence in the box. And Bro is a very young talent. I think if he's given a chance in that Chelsea team, when you have the likes of Chilwell or Kukurea and Reese James, uh, in the team, creating for him, he could be quite good. And from an FPL point of view, that'd be real good. That's the one thing that Broya has over Lukaku, 
uh, that why he would fit better off in, in, in Chelsea's team is because he can actually hold up the ball and he doesn't just get lost in games because he's constantly harrying the defenders and can actually run them behind. Is his finishing, you know, pinpoint? A little bit to be desired. But you never know until you try. I take Ronaldo, but doesn't suit. He likes the press from the front, and Ronaldo doesn't do that. But the thing is, you don't need a strike. Like, this is this is the myth that's kind of just baffling, like, for, for like, pressing. Like, people think that pressing systems, you have to run 10,000 kilometers a game constantly all the time. The majority of the time, Ronaldo doesn't need to press. You want to know why? Because Chelsea will have the ball. <laughs> that's why. And what you do... Because Tuchel's a smart guy, what most teams do is they do what Ajax did with Sebastian Haller. They do what Bayern Munich does with Lewandowski. And you can do the same thing with Ronaldo. What you do is you take your striker and you say, you see that center back that's very good at playing out from the back? Just stand next to him. What does that do? That completely eliminates him. They cannot pass the ball to him because you will take it off them. Simple, right? What does that also allow you to do? Well, it means that you can force them to play in a certain direction, potentially towards their weak point in their team. As an example, Man United. When Maguire was playing uh, versus Brentford, Tony or Mbomo or Vissa or whoever the front three was that was uh, like put in that scenario stood on Lissandra Martinez basically the whole game. Why? Because Lissander Martinez, when he gets the ball, is very good. So they basically stood on him and said, you're not allowed to pass to this guy. You need to pass it to Maguire. What does Maguire do? Well, Maguire takes way too long on the ball. And Maguire would try to force stuff to Luke Shaw when, he's on, when he was on the left-hand side. That's what they also did when Varane and Maguire played. Well, Maguire often played at left-sided centre-back. They would put somebody on Varane. They would give it to Maguire and they would play it over to Shaw and then Shaw would pass it back to Maguire. Another problem is that when Wambasaka played, basically Wambasaka was a pressing trigger because Wambasaka may be able to get rid of the ball, but he's not going to get rid of the ball efficiently. Another pressing trigger for United was every time Fred got the ball. Every time Fred got the ball, he was often, if he was rushed, he would lose it in very dangerous positions. So they would force traps onto the team so that certain players get the ball that aren't as comfortable increasing your chances of likely them making a mistake and you getting a better opportunity that's what Chelsea can do Chelsea can just take Ronaldo or Broya or whoever tell them stick on like so if Chelsea goes and plays against uh who's a good example let's say they go up against Man City right uh if I'm Chelsea, I'm going to take Ronaldo and stick him on, uh, let's say they have, you know, currently they would have maybe, what, Diaz and Stones? Stones has been mistake prone in the past. I would take Ronaldo and I would stick him on Diaz. And then what would happen is if Stones ever played the ball or tried to play the ball into Rodri, I would make sure that that line of pass was cut out every time. I would make it so the ball can't go into Rodri. Every time. And I would try to force the ball into someone like Riyad Mahrez in a situation to where he's so wide and so far away from goal that they have to recycle the ball. And then when the ball is going back to John Stones is when you harry him down and force him to do something that could potentially lead to a mistake. That's what you could do. This is what you can do. Also, conveniently enough, if John Stones is is, uh, he would be on you guys' screen here. If like the, if he's going up the pitch this way, right? He's the the other the, the goal he's trying to score and is down down the bottom of the screen. If he's here and Diaz is here, Ronaldo is going to be on Diaz over here. The second the ball goes out to Riyad Mahrez on this side, out on the flank, all Ronaldo has to do is cheat this way towards Stones. If, we, if they know that the ball is coming back to him, and the second the ball is coming back to Stones, Ronaldo's already running to Stones, and because his the shadow he casts, basically his body, is blocking off the Diaz pass unless Diaz changes his angle, he has to go back to Ederson. 
And then, what can you do there? Well, you have Raheem Sterling and Reese James press up to Diaz and Cancelo. And then now Edison's forced to make a decision. Does he go back and go potentially across Ronaldo back to Stones? Or does he kick it long? If you do that effectively enough, Ronaldo can press. Because you only have to use him in certain moments. Pressing isn't just the constant running around trying to get the ball. It's not. People make it seem that way. People make it seem you got to run 13k off the ball constantly to try to get the ball back. No. You do it in certain moments to where you can make an opportunity for yourself. Because aimlessly running around, you end up looking like what Bielsa's Leeds team did. Which basically, they just ran up and marked a player man for man. That's what people think pressing is. That's not pressing. That's just man to man. They do that in other sports, right? There's different types of pressing where you can do man to man pressing, but there's also, like, so the difference between the way Liverpool press and the way Man City press is different. The systems are different, the pressing triggers are different. What they're trying to achieve is different. Liverpool are trying to take the ball off of players. Man City are more trying to cut down the options to where you make a bad decision or you give the ball back to them. And they also do that in a counter-pressing system to where the second they lose the ball, they want to get it back as soon as possible because if they get it back sooner rather than later, the likelihood is they're further up the pitch and you're not set to means they can go down the field and score. That's why Liverpool is so good. That's why Man City is so good because they know when and where to do it. Often, in, later on in games, if things aren't going Liverpool's way, you often see them actually sit back a little bit. That's not because they're tired. I mean, it probably is a little bit. But it's mainly because of the fact that they're trying to force teams into making a bad pass, whereas they can then spring on the break. Because Liverpool are very good on the counterattack, too. That's what they try to do to Man City. It's also what Klopp complains about a lot. But... Yeah. Anyway, getting back on to FPL because we've been we've been live for forty one minutes and I've probably been talking about just normal football things for about thirty five of it at least. Um, but I think Ronaldo Ronaldo doesn't have to press from the front because if he just man marks somebody, um, then the pressing's done for him. He doesn't have to. Like it just makes it makes more sense to do that. That's exactly what Ten Hag did with Haller um, at Ajax. Haller is not the quickest, highest energy player. But he was able to work brilliantly in that system. And also when he had quality delivery, he scored goals, funnily enough. Um, anyway, where were we? I think we were talking about I think we were talking about Paris is getting a clean sheet. Cancelo just the one point again. He also got subbed off as well, by the way, but that was after the 60 minute mark. Uh Gundogan was part of our two transfers. Uh, we were four points down on those two transfers, but I would have burnt one otherwise. So it, I think it probably breaks even because the transfer Burning a transfer would have been like taking a four-point hit, to be honest. Um, so, and I think long, I think Gundogan's going to start versus Forest, which is a good thing. Um, and if Holland starts, that's going to be great as well, because I think Gundogan and Holland pair well together. Again, another systematic thing where a lot of the players are going to be looking at Erling Holland, and they're not going to be paying attention to the likes of Bernardo Silva and Gundogan, who make very good runs in the box. We've talked about that before, though. Uh, Martinelli and Jesus again, nothing between them. Salah captain again, disappointing. Nine goals, no returns. Uh, Ward, Andreas, De Silva, and Archer. Archer actually came on. Oh, okay. What do you got? Oh, you got one minute. Nice. Sweet. If you have to burn a transfer, by the way, don't burn a transfer. Just change Archer to Stansfield uh, from Fulham. He's Stansfield's more likely to play. I know Cabano is back, but I think Stansfield still came on anyway. Uh, moving on to the predictions that we made. We do the predictions every week. Where are they? They're right here. So, we did predictions every week for every game. And basically what we do is if we get, uh, if we get the exact score right, we get three points. If we get the result right, we still get one point. And if we... Um, if, let's say, I predicted um, United to lose 1-0 to Southampton, um, then I would get zero points as an example. So, we have to get the draw, win, or uh, loss correct uh, for for the respective team. So, in United's case, we get one point because we predicted 2-0. Um, and they won 1-0. So, we get the one point there. 
Brentford, I predicted 2 0 over Everton. Actually, it was a, a you know, fairly entertaining game. Uh, ended up being 1 1, so we don't get any points for that. Brighton, I predicted 2 1 over Leeds. Uh, they won by the same kind of difference, as it were, one goal, uh, but didn't get the score right. So just the one point there. Chelsea, Leicester was close, close. Chelsea, had Chelsea scored another one, I would have got it right, 3-1. But surprising because Chelsea were down to 10 men. Uh, so we got the one point there. Liverpool, Bournemouth, definitely wasn't 3-1. It was 9-0, but we still got the one point there. Man City, 2-1 over Crystal Palace. Ended up being 4-2, so just had to double the score. Uh, but again, still got the result correct. Same with Arsenal versus Fulham. Predicted 3-0, ended up being 2-1. Villa versus West Ham. Uh, predicted 1-1. Villa just looked really, really bad. Uh, West Ham managing to get themselves on the points board uh, after getting no points in the first three. So they're looking good now. But we didn't get that one correct. Uh, Newcastle versus Wolves. Predicted 2-1 Newcastle. Did pan out that way. Ended up 1-1. Wolves will probably be disappointed because I think the goal was scored uh, later on in the game. Uh, and then Spurs, New, uh, so I'm going to say Newcastle Spurs, Nottingham Forest, uh, predicted 2-0 for Spurs, end up getting that one exactly correct. So we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9 points in total. That's actually above uh, what we want to get every week. That is terrible on how that says points, but that's fine. Um, basically, what we want to get is um, five, um, 5 correct results and then 1 correct score, getting 6 out of 10 every week so we did one up that uh clean sheet for brentford not to be the case a differential goalkeeper david de gea came through uh john stones i believe got himself assist although he did score an own goal but he got some bonus points too so we consider that a su success ilkay gundawen didn't start but got himself an assist as well and then danny welbeck didn't play any part in the brighton goal but uh three out of five on the differentials ain't bad that's above uh, the halfway point. So we got ourselves a good score this week. Nine points with the three out of five uh, on the differentials. So after a bad start in the first week, where we only got five points and one on the five on differentials, uh, we're doing pretty good. 11 points, nine, uh, 11 points, eight points, and then nine points. So I'm just writing down just so we can keep a note of it. Um, in the old notepad just for future references uh, moving on to predictions for this week move that out of the way uh, let's bring up the notepad which is going to be blank we got Crystal Palace versus Brentford to start us off alongside Fulham versus Brighton this is on Tuesday remember the deadline is on a Tuesday so make sure to pay attention to this number up here this time because if you miss out on the deadline that won't be good so we have four games on the Tuesday Chelsea Southampton and then Leeds versus Everton kicking off uh, at 8 o'clock UK time we then have Arsenal versus Aston uh, Villa can't type uh, Bournemouth versus Wolves kicking off at the same time same with Man City will host uh, Forest then we also have slightly later kickoff. We have West Ham versus Tottenham. And then Liverpool will host Newcastle at Anfield. Then the one final game on the Thursday, September the 1st, is Leicester hosting Manchester United at the King Power Stadium. Of course, we will do our clean sheet and differential picks as well. So... Let's take a look at who we are going to pick for what. So, Crystal Palace versus Brentford. I think Palace have been playing quite well. I think Brentford are also playing quite well. Um, if Wilfred Zaha's out, that could be a bit difficult for them. I still think Crystal Palace get it done, though, especially if Zaha's back. Well, again, we don't know the prognosis yet. I believe on that front. I still think Crystal Palace at home have been quite good. I don't think they can keep a clean sheet though. I'm going
Um, I think that Brighton have been playing so well, and I think they will win this one. I think Mitrovic is still a bit of a problem for teams. I'm going to go the reverse, uh, the flip score of the first prediction, and I'm going to go 2-1 in favor of Brighton getting another away win. Southampton versus Chelsea. I think Southampton just aren't in great form at the moment. Chelsea should be able to cast aside Southampton quite easily. I think defensively, Chelsea are going to be much more assured with Fofana. Whether he comes straight into the team or not, that is yet to be seen. But Koulibaly is back, so I think that they should be fine. I'm going to go with Chelsea uh, winning the game 3-1. I just think Southampton will probably nick one. Um... For whatever reason. I just, I just have a feeling that Chelsea won't keep a clean sheet when they should. Um, Leeds versus Everton. Leeds are at home as well. I think this should be quite easy for Leeds actually. Uh, I'm going to go Leeds to beat Everton uh, 3-1. I think Leeds probably won't keep a clean sheet. But I think Leeds will probably beat them quite comfortably. Uh, same with Arsenal versus Villa. I don't see Villa doing anything in this one. I think Gerrard is definitely on the caution. I think Arsenal will get back to clean sheet ways. And they'll get the 3-0 win. Uh, Wolves, I think Bournemouth just coming off the very, very, you know, disappointing uh, game versus Liverpool conceding nine goals. And I don't think they're going to score again unless Solanke's fully fit. I expect Wolves to win 1-0. Man City versus Forest. This should be quite easy for them. I think they'll keep the clean sheet, to be honest. Um, you know, Forest tend to attack. Uh, at least that's what we saw in the game versus Spurs today. And I think that City, if you do that to them, they're going to be much more punishing uh, than most teams, if not all of them, in the Premier League. So I expect City to win 3-0. Uh, West Ham, I think they still have goal trouble, to be honest. Um, so I'm actually going to go with the 2-0 Spurs victory in that London derby. Liverpool and Newcastle. This could be a competitive game, actually. I think Newcastle will be quite good. A quite good test for Liverpool. I think it will be quite close. I'm going to go with the 2-1 favor Liverpool. And then Leicester versus Manchester United. Uh, Casemiro should start this game. I don't think Anthony, who has reportedly signed for Manchester United uh, for 100 million euros, which is probably 40 more than what he was should have been bought for back in June, but the club decided to drag its feet, and that sort of thing happens when you are run badly um, and your owners need to go. But aside from that, I think Leicester just haven't been playing well. If Madison's still out, that's a problem for them. Um, Leicester's games usually start at 1-1, um, but I expect United to win the game. Uh, I'm going to go with United being much more uh, much more solid in defense. I actually think they'll keep a clean sheet, actually. I'm going to say United win 2-0. Oh, wait, the King Power. Uh, clean sheet this week. Uh, I'm actually going to go for Wolves versus Bournemouth. For goalkeeper, let's see. Who do we have in goal that could keep a clean sheet this week? Jose Saw is an option. Who else we got? I only have two clean sheets here, so let's go for Jose Saw. For Wolves, he was, what, 4 point something percent? 4.8, so just inside the differential mark, which is great. I think we picked him earlier on in the season, but I think it's a good enough fixture uh, for him to get it. Uh, in defense, who are we going to pick? Who's going to be a good defender this week? Hmm. Not so sure, to be honest. I'm not so sure. Hmm. It's actually quite tough, to be honest. I don't know. I really don't know. Maybe a Man United defender way at Leicester? Let's go for Malasia. I'm pretty sure he's not 1-5% owned, for sure. Tyro Malasia. I think we predicted him earlier on the season, too. But with the fixtures, he's kind of tough. 2.7%, uh, actually, which is interesting. A lot more than I thought he was going to be. 
Um, in midfield, who is a differential midfielder that we can choose from here? I'm going to go for... Let's go for... I know who we can go for. Let's go for Sinistera. I think he'll probably get his first start uh, for Leeds this weekend. Sinistera. Leeds. 0.2% owed. 6.5 million, which is a bit pricey uh, for Leeds Tacker, in my opinion. But I think he could do quite well. Uh, and the forwards. Who... Who are we going to choose? Fortunately, a lot of the forwards are quite pricey. And highly owned for that reason. Um, what is Ronaldo's ownership? It can't be that high. Ronaldo's only 3.2% owned. Let's go Ronaldo. Because Anthony Martial could be injured. I never thought I would say Cristiano Ronaldo would be a differential pick. But he is. So, yeah. Interesting. Very, very interesting. So, yeah. Cristiano Ronaldo. 3.2% if you want to go for a crazy differential. He's the one. We talked about him a lot this stream. Right. Excuse me. That yawn was coming for a while, I think. Let's move on to how the team looks this week. So, we've got Ramsdale and Goal versus Aston Villa. We've got Trent uh, at home to Newcastle. Trippier away to Liverpool, which I'm actually going to swap out right now for Andres Pereira. And play a 4-4-2, I think, is what we're going to go with. We've reached James away to Southampton. Parasits away to West Ham. Um, I think Parasits will play, by the way, versus West Ham. Not mainly because he's done well basically every time he's played. Um, but also, Parasits is very good on set pieces too. Jao Cancelo at home to Forrest. Andres Perrin, now newly in the team, uh, versus Brighton at home. Salah, home to Newcastle. Martinelli, home to Aston Villa. Gundogan, home to Nottingham Forest. Jesus with the vice captaincy at home to Aston Villa. And Holland with the captaincy currently at home to Nottingham Forest. I'm still kind of torn if Pep's like, yeah, he's probably not going to play. Then I'll probably just stick it on Salah and be boring. Uh, but I like Holland this week. Again, he has the easiest fixture, arguably. Him or Jesus, uh, to be honest. Um, so yeah, that's who we're kind of going with at the moment. I think if I knew Holland was 100% starting versus Forrest, I mean, it's guaranteed to be on him. We also have the differential pick uh, that's just 5% on with Gundogan, uh, who's done, who started the season off quite good uh, with two goals and an assist. I expect him to start versus Forrest as well. Um, so, yeah, that could be quite good. Jesus at home to Villa is also another good shout as well. Um, although in the two games where managers have been looking to to captain him. He's only just got the one assist. Uh, and he's been booked in both of them, which is obviously not great for FPL points. Um, but him being highly owned means that if you didn't captain him, you did well. So, that's good. Um, because of effective ownership, which is kind of annoying, uh, to be honest. All things considered. But, uh, yeah, what am I looking to potentially do? So, I have one free transfer, so I can cover... Uh, some things if I need to. I have 0.3 million in the bank, so I can't do anything super, super drastic. Do I want to change Ramsdale potentially before Aston Villa at home? No, we might want to save that till next week, I think. 
um, and get rid of him versus Man United away um, and find a goalkeeper that maybe is better for the next three. I think Brentford away, Man United away could be tricky. I think Everton at home should be should be fine. Um, so maybe find maybe finding a better goalkeeper might work out. Um, you know, Dean Henderson, he has Bournemouth at home, uh, Leeds away, uh, and Fulham at home. So maybe that's the goalkeeper we go for at 4.5 million. He'll make a lot of saves. He saved two penalties already this season, uh, which is crazy. Um, so maybe that's who we go for. Another option is obviously Robert Sanchez. He would have Leicester at home, Crystal Palace, uh, a Bournemouth away, and Crystal Palace at home, so that's another option. So, if we were to have two free transfers going into game week six, because basically we'll be able to make two free transfers uh, in two days' time, basically, uh, we could get rid of Ramsdale. We could bring in Henderson, uh, because Ramsdale's good fixtures will have mostly run out. And if we're wild carding in between game week eight and nine, Arsenal's fixtures after game week nine is Spurs, Liverpool. Man City, Leeds away. I mean, those aren't great fixtures at all. Like, you don't necessarily want to triple up on Liverpool. Uh, potentially don't want to have Gabriel Jesus anymore, to be honest. Is there better players to get, get in instead of him? Maybe there is. So, we would then have 0.7 million to pick and choose what we would want to um, potentially upgrade there. So... Who would it be? Um, well, there is arguments to say that after the you know after that game, maybe we just get rid of Jesus. That's a possibility. And depending on what Darwin Nunez's price is by the time you know the game week rolls around to, because game week six is Darwin Nunez back for game week six. Darwin. September 3rd. Yeah. So he's back for the Everton game. So. Do we bring him in for that? I don't know. Maybe. We bring in Mitrovic. As two tough fixtures though, unfortunately. Gaming 6, Gaming 7. But he's been scoring against big big teams, so maybe it's a good option to bring him in. Maybe we take out Salah. Maybe that's an option. Salah would not be considered a captain. So game week six is Salah good captain away to Everton. Probably not. Maybe we forego the goalkeeper. We just keep and keep Ramsdale as is. And then we do like Salah to somebody and then Kane um, in for Archer. Maybe we go that. How good are Spurs' fixtures from game week 6 to game week 8? Fulham and Leicester at home are very good. And City away? Eh, not so much. Champions League will also be rotation in there as well. Kane's probably the more secure pick. So Salah versus, what is that? Everton away, Wolves at home, Chelsea away. What's the likelihood that Salah scores, outscores Kane versus Leicester, Fulham, and Man City? I think it's quite close, actually. So what would that look like? Well, Kane would go in here. Kane's also scored twice again. He did miss a penalty, though. Four goals. First four matches. Looking good. Literally, I got rid of him and he started scoring. Salah, we can go up to a 6.8 million midfielder. We could go for a cheaper midfielder. Um, if we didn't, get, let's say we didn't get rid of Ramsdale, we'd be a 6.4 million midfielder. Assuming Kane doesn't go up in price or anything like that. So, let's put the 6.5 million midfielders on the screen. Midfielder 6.5. So we could still get Rodrigo. We could still get Pascal Gross. We can get Odegaard if we want. We can get St. Maximan if he's fully fit. His fixtures Crystal Palace at home, West Ham away, 
Bournemouth at home. Potentially keep him after that too. Newcastle figures do look quite good. Uh, Pascal Gross, what are his fixtures looking like? Well, again, he's got the same as uh, same as Sanchez. Leicester at home, Crystal Palace and Bournemouth away. Could be good. Harrison. Brentford away, Forrest at home, Man United away. Bit tricky. Rodrigo would be the same. Um, Eze, potentially. Palace. Newcastle away, Man United home, Brighton away. That's going to be tricky. Yeah, there's no real clear answer here. No real clear answer. Jesse Lingard. Bournemouth at home, Leeds away, Fulham at home. Maybe he's the differential pick that we need. In midfield. Something needs to potentially emerge. What about Chelsea's fixtures? Chelsea's fixtures are would be West Ham, Fulham, Liverpool again. Not the greatest. For three game weeks, at least. Or maybe... Instead of Salah... Because Newcastle's fixtures... <coughs> are... Pretty good. But Wilson's injured, right? And uh, where's Alexander Isaac? Isaac could be a nice little 7 million striker that we bring in and could be a crazy differential that we could keep going into game week 9 and 10 in the forward line. We could bring him in. Now, if we still had Salah, we had to find 2.2 million somewhere. Um, maybe that is downgrade Gabriel Jesus. 5.9 million is not a very good forward slot, though. It's not really much there. <clears throat> Rams say we can't downgrade. Cancelo, we could. But again, are we really downgrading Cancelo? Probably not. Um, or maybe we do get rid of Jesus. We bring in Isaac. We then have 1.4 million to spend and then we can upgrade somewhere. And that's what things potentially get interesting. Because we can take one over 4.5 in the midfield. That's 94.9. Again, not great. Tripper, we probably want to keep. If we downgraded Ramsdale to, let's say, like Henderson. We would then have 1.8 million. It could go up to 6.3 in midfield. Again, what is this money ach like achieving? Not much, really. But we could just bank the money. Does Isaac come in and do well over three games versus Jesus? We still have Martinelli there. Again, I'm I'm not sure. But it's just one some options to kind of think about. At the moment. We definitely don't want to make those transfers. Um, so, yeah. Again, just something we can think about. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. We'll probably do a... Um, uh, a lineup preview on... Uh, Thursday or Friday this week. Because I'm going to let the games run out. Um... Because the stream's going to be premiering on the Tuesday. Uh, games on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday. We, I would definitely want to wait there. Um, so probably I'll do a preview stream maybe on the Thursday. Maybe i just do it. Yeah, I'll probably just do it on the Thursday. 
maybe line a preview on the Friday. Might just skip it and then just go for the deadline on the Saturday. We'll have to wait and see. But yeah, that's going to do it for this preview stream here on Twitch. Let's move over to one of our uh, partners for the season. Let's talk about them. So, Fantasy Football Scout is a fantastic members area. You'll see a lot of their stats tables that we use on the deadline streams, which will catch us uh, for that. Uh, we're going to be using those uh, tomorrow. Uh, that's going to be the evening before the actual FPL deadline, uh, as I'm unable to do it on the Tuesday. But you'll also be able to catch it uh, one hour before the FPL deadline for Gaming 6 as well. A uh, bunch of stats tables in there. Fantastic members area. It's going to help improve your FPL game. And they have much, much more to offer in there. So make sure you check it out. Link is in the About section in the description if you're watching this on YouTube and over on our Twitter bio as well. Now, let's move over to the big screen. So, that's going to do it. Game Week Preview. Game Week 5. Done and in the books. Rotation looming. I don't think it's going to be as bad as, you know, we think. We do have some okay players that can come off the bench. And I think we should be fine, all things considered. Just don't be going with a bunch of crazy differentials that might not play week to week, as an example. So, like, I wouldn't be putting your team with, you know, Perisic, uh, Doherty, uh, uh, Kieran Tierney. Like, you know, a bunch of different players that may or may not play that might, uh, you know, just not show up. Uh, Bernardo Silva... Uh, would be another example, maybe, I don't know, John Stones, whatever, right? You, you got to play it a bit smart. I think Holland, Jesus, Salah, these sorts of players are going to see the majority of minutes, and even if they come on for 30 minutes, they're still going to do well. You just know that if they potentially could get rotated, you just don't captain them. That's all there is to it, but that's going to be much more difficult to do, and I think that could play a key part in kind of mixing things up uh, later on in the season, but that's going to do it. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to like, favorite, subscribe, leave a comment on the VODs as well. We do these streams over on Twitch. So if you want to catch us live, make sure to come over and join us uh, for the live streams. We'll be doing one tomorrow for the deadline stream. It's going to be a deadline-ish stream because it's going to be the night before. But I will premiere it over on Tuesday, uh, one hour before the FPL deadline. Just so if I have the chance to look in the in in the, the chat for that stream, that you all can ask your questions. And I'll hopefully be able to answer them as well. Thank you all for watching, and until the next one, take care.